my weekly exercise. Please take your Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. I thought for a moment I'd left my message back over in the office. As you know, that happened to me once. <laughs> we're in Acts chapter 25. Tonight we're looking at the first 12 verses, answering, I think, a very practical question. When should you appeal to the government? We may have to do that at some point, and uh, it might not be too far in the future, when suddenly we'll find ourselves in the same situation that Paul found himself in, falsely accused, incarcerated, dwindling away years in prison, and finally he makes an appeal. Acts chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Now when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. But Festus answered, that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them, therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul, and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed things worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? <laughs> unto Caesar shalt thou go. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight. Help us to understand the practical implications that it has for us. To understand when it is appropriate for us as believers to make use of the governmental system, ultimately for the glory of Christ, not merely for our own good and safety. And so, Father, we commit this time to you and pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the last time we were in Acts was all the way back on April 3rd, where we were looking at chapter 24, the last few verses of that chapter, delay salvation and go to hell. Remember, Felix was trembling as Paul reasoned of righteousness and of judgment and said, go your way, uh, someday I'll make a decision. And meanwhile, he was hoping that Paul would give him some money. He was looking for a bribe. Then two weeks ago, Reverend Joe McKnight was here. He was giving us a report on his summer missionary team. And then last week was our mission Sunday with Reverend Everett Yoon. And so back tonight we are with When Should You Appeal to the Government in Acts chapter 25. As we looked at the previous portion of scripture, that message was focused on the central key issues that relate to biblical salvation. I pointed out, we didn't quite finish it, but I pointed out that there are 16 blocks of truth that make up the New Testament doctrine of salvation. So if you can picture in your mind, if you want to see the doctrine of salvation, put four 
blocks down and on top of those put four more blocks and on top of those put four more blocks and on top of those put four more blocks and you've got a great big huge wall that you can label salvation the 16 key blocks of truth that make up the New Testament doctrine of salvation the first block that we looked at centered around the person and work of Christ that is the gospel in a nutshell, of course, the gospel is contained in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses uh, 3 and 4. So if you want to know the gospel in a nutshell, it's there, but it deals with the person and work of Christ, who Jesus is and what he did. The gospel is not good news about what you can do. The gospel is good news about what Jesus has already done. The gospel is not good news about who you are. The gospel is good news about who Jesus is. When we trust Christ, we're giving a response to the gospel, but believing on Jesus is not the gospel. It's a response to the gospel. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Paul says that's the gospel by which you are saved in 1 Corinthians 15. And then he takes one element of that and develops it throughout the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, he takes that element of the resurrection, but when he uses the word Christ, that is Christos, that is Mashiach in Hebrew, but Christos in Greek, it means the anointed one. The one who is revealed in scripture. And the Christ who is revealed in scripture has two parts to his person that are essential. Who Jesus is, he is both God and man. Indissolvably joined throughout all of eternity, from the moment of the incarnation and on into the future as far as you can see. He's the God-man. The second thing relates to his work and Paul gives us those elements both in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 15. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's not a death that somebody makes up. It's not the torture stake of Jehovah's Witnesses or some other phantasm like that. He died on Calvary's cross because that was what was prophesied. And then the second half is he rose from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. All the way back in the Old Testament in the Psalms, for example, David had prophesied the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Isaiah 53 closes with the fact that he, he's going to see his seed, he's going to prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. The Lord who died for our sins and was buried. The one who proves that his death is acceptable to the Father by rising from the dead. That's the good news, the gospel of our salvation. And so the first block of truth centered around the person and work of Christ. Salvation is found in Jesus, the Messiah, alone. The Jewish Messiah, who is a descendant of both Abraham and David, and we looked at lots of verses on that, his salvation results in forgiveness and cleansing from sin. His salvation is an eternal salvation. His salvation is tangible and visible because it changes lives. The salvation that Jesus brings is unique. There is no other way. And we saw that the salvation in Christ results in obedience to Christ. That's the first block of truth that we learned back on April 3rd, and we gave you many references in relation to that all the way through the New Testament. The second block of truth shows the scope of salvation. So if you're laying out the blocks, block number one centers around the person and the work of Christ. Block number two shows the scope of salvation. That is, salvation is available to both Jews and Gentiles. Though Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, he is not only the Messiah of the Jews, he is the Savior of the world. His salvation is available to both Jews and Gentiles. And we gave you many references both out of Acts and out of the book of Romans. Romans 1.16, for example, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul talks about that again, in fact, spends some time on it in Romans chapter 11. The third block of salvation, or the third truth that we studied, centers around the invisible spirit world. The third block of truth concerning salvation 
centers around the invisible spirit world. That is, the demons understand salvation and they know that they can never obtain it. Christ didn't die for the fallen angels. Christ died for sinful men. And we looked at some passages in Acts that dealt with that. The third block centers around the invisible spirit world. The fourth block of truth centers around the speech of those who are saved. How's it going to affect what you say? If you're really saved, will it make a difference in the way you talk? Yes. Salvation is a matter of faith that actually produces the results of a confession. Genuine salvation always results in a verbal testimony. Romans 10.10 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scriptures are very, very clear on that, and you see it all the way through the book of Acts and the way in which the Apostle Paul and the others lived their lives. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. If you're saved, that fourth block of truth centers around the speech of those who are saved. The fifth block of truth regarding salvation is that it applies to the future as well as to the present. Salvation is not merely here and now. Salvation applies to the future as well as to the present. That is, salvation has eschatological application. Salvation deals with things to come as well as things in time present. For example, Romans 13, 11, and now, knowing the time that now is it high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That's still a future event. Salvation encompasses not merely being saved from hell, so that when you die, you go to heaven. Salvation also encompasses our resurrection. We are going to have our bodies raised from the grave, and that is coming yet in the future. Their eschatological application of the doctrine of salvation. Those who are asleep in Christ will rise. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And we looked at many different passages in the future. Salvation also encompasses deliverance from the great tribulation. That's eschatological. First Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation relates to the second coming of Christ. Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Sozo, the same word that's used in all of these passages. You see, there are many facets to and implications that stem from the cross. And some of those reach into the future, and some of those reach all the way into eternity. That's the basis for eternal security. The kind of salvation that God gives reaches all the way into eternity future because we are kept by the power of God unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There are many other verses. We won't go over all of them. That was the fifth block. It's a magnificent block that the truth regarding salvation applies to the future as well as to the present. The sixth block of truth concerning salvation is the insurmountable nature of salvation in times of trial. Let me say that again. The sixth block of truth concerning salvation is the insurmountable nature of salvation in times of trial. In other words, Salvation has the practical application to the sufferings that we go through in this present time. That's one of the things that God guarantees to the believer. There is no trial, no test, no temptation that has ever overtaken you, but such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now we're all at different levels of spiritual growth. There have been some giants in history that none of us will ever reach even up to the navel of those giants. And you know what? They had greater tests than you and I will face. But God never allows a test that he would have given to one of them to come up to you and me. I'm a midget. Because he's promised there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. One of the great verses for that is 2 Corinthians 1.6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. He says it twice in the same verse. No matter how bad it gets, the fact that we have the salvation that is found only in Jesus is the thing that gives you strength to go through the trials. Just a few months ago, it was the strength that gave those men in orange jumpsuits kneeling on the beach. It gave the strength to them, though they knew they were facing death. It gave the strength to them to kneel as their captors stood behind them with drawn knives. And not one of them denied his faith in Jesus. And so their throats were slit and their blood was mingled with the tide. That's genuine salvation. That sixth block concerning salvation is the in, insurmountable nature of salvation in times of trial. The seventh block of truth concerning salvation is the danger of delaying salvation, and that is where we focused most of our time in that message. The danger of delaying salvation. Now is the opportunity that you have. If you're not saved, if you're here tonight, if you're watching over the internet, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't put it off. You may not live through the night. People, even young people, die, and sometimes quite unexpectedly, sometimes quite suddenly, you don't know if you'll live till tomorrow. You see, Felix was putting it off. And Felix is in hell. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Come for our help. That's what succored means. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. It may not come for you. The eighth block of truth concerning salvation is is a warning to watch out for counterfeit salvation. Where God provides an original, where God provides a genuine, Satan always provides a knockoff, an imitation. And it's a very shoddy imitation when you compare it with the reality. You know, all the time, there are counterfeiters of various expensive goods. There are counterfeiters of Rolex watches. They're not really Rolex, but they sure look like it. There are counterfeiters of Gucci purses. They're not really Gucci purses, but they look like it. There are counterfeiters of $20 bills. They look like it, but they're really not like it. And as soon as they're detected, you go to the bank and you take a stack of bills and one of them is a, a fake 20, you know what? Not only will the teller not give you credit in your account for $20, they will take that $20 out and they will save it for the FBI to investigate. 
and so you're $20 short. You're the one that got ripped off. The bank's not going to get ripped off. But you know, a counterfeit salvation is far more dangerous than a counterfeit $20 bill. With that, you merely lose a few bucks. But with a counterfeit salvation, you lose eternity. Yes, there are counterfeit salvations. Now, some of them look pretty good. Some of them look like it really made you feel sorry. Some of those counterfeit salvations look like, you know, you, you really, really, really feel bad about the sin that you did, but it didn't go far enough. 2 Corinthians 7.10 for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But here's the counterfeit. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. It's a life and death choice, folks. Godly sorrow works repentance, not to be repented of. What is repentance? You know the word, metanoia. We've talked about it before. It's a word that means you've been going east and suddenly to repent means you turn around 180 degrees. You don't just turn off course five degrees. You turn around 180 degrees and you go the opposite direction. Genuine repentance results in life change. The sorrow of the world doesn't result in life change. You're sorry that you got caught. You're sorry, so maybe you'll change your ways just a little bit, just so that you can get out from under the scrutiny of the person who has pointed out your problem. They don't want to call it sin. They call it a problem. But godly sorrow works repentance. That's a changed life. You know, you hear me talk a lot about that, but that's because it's all over the Scripture. A godly sorrow works repentance, not to be repented of. That is, you turn around, go 180 degrees, and you never flop back the other way. Not to be repented of. You don't say, well, I guess, uh, I guess I really should go back to that old way of life. I really guess I should go back to that, to that horrible sin that I was involved in. No, it works repentance not to be repented of. Make sure you have genuine salvation and not the counterfeit. The ninth block of truth concerning salvation is that it includes multiple workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I've given you in the past the 39 different works of the Holy Spirit that are listed in Scripture. 39 of them. I doubt seriously if any of you could come up tonight and give me all 39 of the works of the Holy Spirit that accompany salvation. But there are at least 39, and I suspect if we studied the Scripture more, we'd discover even more than that. But I know of at least 39. Do you know what they are? Genuine salvation, that ninth block, includes multiple workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Do you see those works in your life? When you're saved... Did you know that the Holy Spirit has already begun some works? You've been set apart. We're going to talk about that one in just a little bit. By the Holy Spirit unto salvation. Did you know that at the moment that you're saved, you are not only set apart, but you are sealed by the Spirit of God? You are indwelt by the Spirit of God? I'm not going to go through all 39 of them tonight. But let me give you just one, Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is one of the evidences. It's that ninth block concerning salvation, which includes the multiple workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. A seal does a lot of things. A seal preserves from impurity. You know, you all go and buy jars at the grocery store that say, do not use if seal is broken. Because if the seal is broken, some kind of contaminant might have gotten in. 
A seal does something else. A seal shows authority. What was it that the Jews requested of Pilate at the grave of our Lord Jesus Christ? They wanted the governor's seal on it because anybody who broke the seal of the governor had committed a crime that was worthy of death. A seal guarantees authenticity. When you have a document that has a seal on the bottom of it and which is inscribed or encrypted with official seal on it, here's a paper that is good in a court of law. A notary will put a seal on something. It's not a real big deal, but it is a seal that authenticates a piece of paper to show that an individual has either sworn an oath or affirmed to the truth of what's in that document. That's what the Holy Spirit does at the moment of salvation. One of the many things. The earnest of the Holy Spirit. You get that at the moment of salvation. The earnest, the arabon. That's the word that today is used in Greece to refer to an engagement ring. The Holy Spirit is given to us as an earnest, as it were an engagement ring waiting for the bridegroom to come for his bride. And in biblical thought, not in modern culture where girls give rings back to guys when the guy decides to break up and he says, I want my ring back because it cost me, you know, <laughs> well, I bought it at the bubblegum machine, but I still like it. <laughs> now, there are guys sort of like that. Not very good. It cost me some money. I want it back. No. An arabon was given that said, if I don't come through with the wedding, you can keep the ring. Jesus has given us as the arabon of our wedding feast with the Lamb. He has given us the Holy Spirit as our arabon. If he doesn't come through with the wedding feast of the Lamb, we can keep the Holy Spirit. That's the word that's used. Thirty-nine things that relate to the Holy Spirit and his connection to that ninth block of truth concerning salvation. The tenth block of truth concerning salvation that we looked at was victory. Salvation is essential if we want to win in the spiritual warfare. There are many people who are trying to win the spiritual warfare by being good. Many people who are trying to go through life just doing good stuff and thinking that's going to get them into heaven. It's the good works concept of salvation. But they lose all the time. Now they want to admit it, but they catch themselves lying or other people catch them lying. Or they catch themselves lusting. Or they kept catch themselves cheating or stealing and well it wasn't very big it was just a pen by the way you know I've had a lot of pens disappear over here out of that little container did you know that's stealing because I asked you to put them back so that people would have them available to take notes we think that little things are not important but God says little things are a manifestation of our character what we really are inside. We think that it's not important. God says yes, because it shows there's an area of life in your life that has sin that hasn't been dealt with. That was the 11th or 10th block of truth, salvation and victory. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. That guards your head. The eleventh block of truth concerning salvation is that genuine salvation always results in works of righteousness in the life of the believer. Are you building that wall, that wall of salvation? Are you seeing what is tied together in Scripture with the doctrine of salvation? Eleventh block, genuine salvation always results in works of righteousness in the life of the believer. 
Hebrews 6, 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. Or Philippians 2, 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, obey, work out your own salvation. That's the outworking of salvation with fear and trembling. The twelfth block of truth concerning salvation is that salvation is the result of the elective purposes of God, not the will of man. That's why you don't have to worry about whether or not it's going to be eternal. Because God's the one who does the work. God's the one who does the willing. It relates to the elective purposes of God. That is a wonderful, encouraging, blessed truth. Are you saved? You and I have nothing to boast about our salvation because it came as a result of the elective purposes of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, from the beginning, you know, that's an interesting phrase. That business about the beginning, you find it in Genesis 1, you find it in John chapter 1. So Paul takes us back there and he says, okay, from the beginning, God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Huh. Well, there we get back to one of those works of the Holy Spirit in the doctrine of salvation. One of the 39 works of the Holy Spirit that relate to our salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. God has chosen you to salvation and belief of the truth. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The thirteenth block of truth concerning salvation is that salvation is a matter of grace and not a matter of works. Works proceed from salvation. They do not produce salvation. Salvation is a matter of grace and not of works. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The fourteenth block of truth concerning salvation is that salvation entails responsibilities from those who are saved. In other words, nobody gets a free ride after they're saved, even though salvation itself is free. But you don't get a free ride after you're saved and just say, I can live any way I want to. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I have no obligations. I have no responsibilities. Let's go to it, boys. Let's sin that grace may abound. Paul says, God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Salvation is by grace through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the next verse, don't forget it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God before hath ordained that we should walk in them. If you're saved, that means that you don't have to think up your own good works. God has previously foreordained the good works specifically that you will walk in. Do you see it in your life? That's why Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether or not you be reprobate or whether or not you be in the faith. If you don't see any productivity in your life, it may mean that you are reprobate. You're faking it. You're trying to appear the same as all the other Christians. You're saying the right things with your mouth, but your life has not been changed. Your people, it's all over the scripture. Every one of these things ties together. The fourth, 14th block concerning the truth of salvation is that salvation entails responsibilities from those who are saved. Nobody gets a free ride after salvation. The fifteenth block of truth relate to salvation is the matter of security for the elect. Security for the elect. God uses angels to protect the elect until they are saved. We saw that as we looked at the book of Hebrews. The opening chapter of the book of Hebrews talks about the ministering of angels to those who are going to be the heirs of salvation. The sixteenth and final block, the capstone truth, 
related to salvation, and this is very important. That's why it's the capstone. God uses the scripture to draw us to Christ. That's the 16th capstone truth related to salvation, that God uses the scriptures to draw us to Christ. You know the verse. You know verse 16. You ought to know verse 15. 2 Timothy 3:15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that is the full circle, because that takes us back to the center of salvation, who is Jesus Christ, the person and work of Christ, the very first thing that I gave you. And it is the scripture that makes us wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the background and why Paul had the courage to do what he did as he stood before his judges in Acts chapter 25. The text that we have before us tonight gives some very interesting hints as to when we should appeal to government for relief as Christians, but I think the first one is very obvious. In our text here tonight, Paul was already a prisoner. Now, you're not yet a prisoner. But it may be not too long in the future that you and I are going to be prisoners because we're Christians. Paul was already a prisoner. Paul was already charged with a crime against the Jews. And they had twisted the charge to make it a crime against the state. You notice Paul says three things. He says, as he's making his defense, he says, I haven't sinned against the Jews. I've not committed a crime against the Jews. I've not committed a crime against the temple. And I have not committed a crime against Caesar. All three were phony charges. But they knew that what Paul was preaching would overturn their power. And they weren't about to have that happen. They were power hungry. They were mad for power and control. Oh, throughout all of history, you see people like that. They normally show up as dictators. They cannot tolerate anybody who would stand against what they are saying, even if what they're saying is total lies and fabrications and a rewrite of history. And of course, we've had revisionist history around for centuries. So the obvious first case in which a Christian can appeal to government is when he's already incarcerated and there is no other means of escape. You know, as we look at this passage tonight, God could have opened the jail for Paul just like he had done earlier for Peter. You know, God opened the jail for Peter. God had actually opened the jail for Paul earlier too, hadn't he? There at Philippi. And everything went shaky. And the stones began to fall. And the doors popped open. And all the chains fell off of all of the prisoners. You know something? Paul didn't walk out then. Other people's lives would have been at stake if he had done it. Instead, we see a massive, beautiful, incredible salvation. Because Paul didn't run. God could have done that again here for Paul. God doesn't always work the same way every time. Did you know that? God does different things at different times, even in the lives of the same people. God could have opened the jail for Paul, but he chose not to do so. And you know, it's rather interesting. I mean, maybe Paul was praying for that. We don't know. But Paul had been incarcerated for a long time. He'd been incarcerated for several years by the time we get to this point. You and I would say, wow, that means he was just sitting, spinning his wheels. No, he was not just spinning his wheels. He was witnessing to a very important key man. A man that God was giving incredible number of opportunities to. But a man who kept rejecting salvation. You know, God doesn't always do that with everybody. He did it with Pharaoh. We've been studying that in the morning messages. He got, gave Pharaoh ten opportunities, very clear opportunities, to repent. And Pharaoh would not. Perhaps there's someone listening to this message out in the audience here or out on the internet that God has given many opportunities and many years 
of contact with a particular Christian who has been faithful in sharing the good news of Christ with you. And you keep putting it off. Pharaoh lost his firstborn son and then lost his own life as the chariots followed Israel into the Red Sea. Don't put it off. God may have given you a lot of time. It's not because God is weak. It's because God is merciful. Paul had been incarcerated for several years at that point. The rationale in this situation is, and here is the first reason for appealing to government, unjust jail time is hindering the spread of the gospel. That's what was taking place, and God finally said, okay, it's time. You've had all the chance you're going to get. Felix and Festus, Festus didn't get as long as Felix did. But there's the hindrance of the spread of the gospel, and God had said that he was going to take Paul and send him to Rome. You know, this is obviously not an issue if you're not incarcerated already. However, it may be an issue if you have a court-ordered TRO, or Temporary Restraining Order. You know, Christians have those kinds of things put against them all the time. Those who have stood on the sidewalk outside of abortion clinics and then they get the bubble zone treatment. They can't be within a certain number of yards of the abortion clinic. They get thrown off the sidewalk or they get arrested even if they're in a, a public forum. Some of them have actually been hurt and beaten up by police. It may be an issue if you have a temporary restraining order that's hindering the spread of the gospel. For example, that's one of the reasons that groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom take free speech cases for Christians who are prohibited from witnessing when pagans have the free speech rights in the same areas such as the public forum of sidewalks or public parks. That's why that group that I'm part of takes those cases because you cannot treat Christians as second-class citizens. Now it's getting where some of the courts don't care. Just like we have a case here where there's a court that doesn't care. Even though they get a different judge, it's still the same old, same old. The second obvious case in which a Christian can appeal to government is when there is a higher court that can render an ultimate decision not based on local politics. You know, a lot of stuff that happens happens because you've got local politics going on and people are trying to play games and stop something locally so that they can keep their own power and authority. That's what's going on here. Felix and Festus, and to an extent both Herod and Bernice, were controlled by a self-serving desire of the local judges to avoid trouble and to save face. The third reason that we see in the text in which a Christian can appeal to government is when there is a shift in power and outside forces reinstate their charges. A shift in power is going on here. There is movement in the government. You know, folks, we're facing some movement in the government. Are you aware of that? Just a few months away from now, there's going to be some shifts in power. There might also, if things get out of hand, be martial law. And no matter who wins an election, if martial law is declared, the same person will still be in power. And martial law means a crackdown with military and police force. And you know who up throughout history has been considered the troublemakers? Christians and Jews. You say it couldn't happen here. Oh, yes, it could. You may need this. The third reason we see in the text in which a Christian can appeal to government is when there is a shift in power and outside forces reinstate their charges. You see, with the, within days of the shift from Felix to Festus, the Jews pressed their case against Paul again. They just sort of let it have been sitting around, but now, two years later, hey, they see another chance. Festus thought that he had achieved a happy balance by just keeping Paul locked up. The Jews more or less were satisfied because they had stopped Paul from spreading Christianity, but they had not forgotten Paul. And when they thought they had a chance, they moved in for the kill. 
The fourth reason that we see in the text in which a Christian can appeal to the government is when the Christian is facing death as the outcome of the lower court decision. In this case, you have nothing to lose. You might as well appeal. Paul knew that if he were sent back to Jerusalem, a squad of assassins would be ready to waylay his party. And you know, there's something else that I think is important for us to keep in mind when we look at that. It was not merely Paul's concern for himself and his safety, but his concern for the lives of those who would be transporting him back to Jerusalem. The assassins would be trying to get to Paul. The soldiers that would be accompanying him would be defending Paul. But the assassins would kill any soldiers or others in the party, perhaps even Festus himself, as they tried to get through to Paul. Christians can appeal to government when the Christian is facing death and that's the outcome of the lower court because you might as well appeal at that point. There's nothing else to lose. The fifth reason that we see in the text in which a Christian can appeal to the government is when the Christian perceives that he might get a fairer trial on appeal. When the Christian perceives that he might get a fairer trial on appeal. You see, the first two trials by Felix and then Festus, with the advice of the council, were obviously designed for self-protection of the judges in the council with no regard for the truth of the matter or with regard for the prisoner. This is what we call a change in venue. A change of venue is sometimes an appropriate motion by the prisoner when there is evidence of judicial bias. But a change of venue is worthless if the prisoner is still going to be judged by the same judge only in a more hostile environment. And that's what's going on here. See, Festus was playing footsie with the Jews by suggesting that Paul be judged of him in Jerusalem, which was the whole center hotbed of hatred against Paul. I mean, nothing's going to change by moving the trial to Jerusalem there. You're not going to have a new judge. You're not going to have a, a fairer council. You're simply going to put yourself in a, a much more difficult situation if you move to Jerusalem. But says, hey, Festus was willing, willing to do the Jews a pleasure. When a judge functions like that, you don't want that judge. Uh, he's going to do a favor for somebody on the opposite side. Move for a change of venue. That's a different venue than is being suggested by your opponent. And of course, there are a lot of venue rules. You can and can't move the, the trial to certain places, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. We don't worry about it. There was an obvious change of venue possibility here. You know, that was sort of like asking an American Jew in World War II if he would be willing to be judged in Berlin. Do you think he would like that new venue? I think not. The sixth reason that we see in the text in which a Christian can appeal to the government is when the judge shows that he is willing to listen to bogus, unprovable charges, which is what we see down here in verses 7 through 9. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. You know, the basis for real law is truth. The point of a trial is to weed out lies. The point of the trial is to show whether or not there is enough proof to cause one side to win and one side to lose, or vice versa. Is there enough proof to convict this prisoner? And if so, does the proof point to a certain type of crime? And if so, are there specific levels within that crime between misdemeanors and felonies? And what level of felony? And what are the penalties that are available for those who commit that level of fel felony? But it says they could not prove, they couldn't prove anything. They yelled and screamed about him. They got hot under the collar. They probably were very obnoxious and made Festus feel pretty uncomfortable because he thought, man, I've suddenly been assigned to take care of this group of people. Whoa. So just to pacify it, to settle it down, he's willing to do them a favor. Christians can appeal to the government when the judge shows that he's willing to listen to bogus, unprovable charges, as we see in verses 7 through 9. Paul simply replied, neither against the law of the Jews, that's one, 
neither against the temple, that's two, nor yet against Caesar, that's three, have I offended anything at all. They couldn't prove one charge that they brought against him in those three categories. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things by me? Hey, you Jew, you want to go to Berlin? Hitler's there right now, and he might be a pretty good judge. Forget it. The seventh reason we see in the text in which Christians can appeal to the government is when you see that the judge really does know the truth, but he's afraid to act on it. When you see that the judge really does know the truth, but he's afraid to act on it. Look at what Paul says in verse 10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong. Now look at these last five words. As thou very well knowest. Paul doesn't say, I think you may have got a, a wrong impression of the situation here. And, and you know, I know you've not been feeling well recently and I saw you taking a couple of Excedrin before the trial today, so you probably have had a headache. No. Enough evidence had been presented, and the man was an intelligent man. He wouldn't have gotten into that position if he were not. He was a man who understood Roman law, otherwise he wouldn't be sitting as a judge. You know, nobody puts judges in positions of authority, a judicial authority, if they've never been to law school and if they've never studied anything about the law and if the only thing they've ever studied was underwater basket weaving. They don't get to be judges. He's a man who knew the law. He's a man who understood the proofs and the evidences as thou very well knowest. Paul sees that he has a judge who really does know the truth, but he's afraid to act on it. And it's really interesting what Paul says in verse 11. You see, Paul not only knew the law, but Paul was willing to pay the penalty of the law if he violated the law. If I be an offender, or if I have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. In other words, I would insist that you kill me if I am guilty. How many people on death row say that? If I'm guilty, I insist that you kill me. I'm not going to appeal it. I know I'm guilty. I want the electric chair. I know I'm guilty. Give me the gas chamber. I know I'm guilty. Hang me from the hangman's noose. I know I'm guilty. Stand me in front of the firing squad. Have you ever heard of anybody who was guilty saying that? No. This is one of the proofs of Paul's innocence. Paul says, I refuse not to die if I'm an offender, if I've committed anything worthy of death. But, let's go by the law. If there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. It's a kangaroo court when a judge turns a prisoner over to the mob to lynch him just to save his own skin. The eighth and final reason that we draw from the text in which a Christian can appeal to the government is when the legal right to do so is already a provision of the law that cannot be blocked by the illegal actions of the plaintiff, the prosecutor, or the judge. Paul knew his rights as a Roman citizen. And he knew that he had that right, and neither the plaintiff, that's the Jews, nor the prosecutor, that's the ones they hired against him like Tertullus, or the judge, either Felix or Festus, none of them had the right under law to block that provision of the law. No man may deliver me unto them, I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, they probably said, you know, that's probably the best idea that's come up all day. I mean, you know, we've had G uh, Paul here for the last couple of years, and, and they sort of sat silent, because the council had been around, you know. He sort of, everything was sort of cool, but, but you know, now we got the problem again. We can get rid of this problem entirely simply by moving Paul out. Let's get rid of him. We get rid of the problem. That wasn't the right thing to do. That wasn't the fair thing to do. That wasn't the just thing to do. That wasn't the legal thing to do. But if we can just get rid of him, then everything will be back to cool. 
we can wishy-washy our way along. Just get rid of him. Just get rid of him. Just get rid of him. Shove him out, shove him out, shove him out. I mean, it takes months to get to Rome. And then, you know, it's going to take a time. For, I mean, Caesar's busy, you know. He'll have to sit there in Rome for a long time. I mean, it'll be years before his case comes up. And meanwhile, we can take care of the other little, little things. But, I mean, this seems to be the hot issue right now. This is a big potato. Let, let's get rid of this one. And then we can breathe a sigh of relief. How often has that happened in history? It happens all the time, folks. All over the globe. Just sort of shove the problem far enough away where the people who are screaming and yelling settle down. It might be good for us to think about these things. Eight reasons for appealing. In the event that someday we're incarcerated for being a Christian, and if there is, though we can't count on it, some semblance of legal process by which we can get out of difficult local situations. Practical. You know, God never puts anything in the Bible that he doesn't design for our good. He hasn't stuck any verses in that are superfluous. He hasn't put in any portions of narrative that have no practical application for Christians today. It would be wise for us to think about the things that we've just read. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. We thank you for your word, for its very practical application, especially in times of distress for Christians. We've never really experienced that in this country, but the Christians in Europe have experienced it. They fled the continent. They came to America. They established religious freedom. They understood what suffering and persecution meant. Those who have lived in Roman Catholic countries know about the inquisitions that have happened there and the many Christians who've been put to death. Those who are in communist and Muslim countries know not merely the pressure but also the threat of death that hangs over each one of their doors. Father, there is nothing that exempts us from that type of thing happening here in the United States. We don't like to think about it because it is a very unpleasant thought. But you've given us your word. You've told us things that have happened and things that because the world is a sinful world will still continue to happen. We pray that from this lesson tonight, it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 499, I